Hello and welcome to Susie's book bag. Halloween has come early, it's actually July. Midnight is here, it's actually the middle of the day. But today we're going to talk about all things gloomy, ghostly and gothic. Here we live with bats and owls. It's a very dark book bag behind me. Um, it is not the book bag um, appropriate to the publisher of the book that I'm going to talk about, but it's none more black, and that's where we are today. Uh, we are here to talk to a fabulous author about her fabulous book. We'll be talking to Cathy Unsworth about Season of the Witch, the book of goth. We're going to forget that it's July, forget that it's holiday time and delve into delve into the darkness. Kathy has been described as the first lady of noir fiction. She's written many thrillers. She's written about London town, uh, its mysteries. And um, she's also actually done a biography of Jordan, the punk um, the punk muse par excellence. So there's a lot to talk about. Uh, please welcome into the book bag, Kathy Unsworth. Good morning, Kathy. I mean, good, good midnight, Kathy. Good midnight, <laughs> you, my weird sister. Thank you for having me here. <laughs> Perfect. Yes, I love being I love being a weird sister. Um, we actually met, I think, through the good auspices of our mutual friend Christopher Fowler, the late lamented. Um, and we used to go to drinks for drinks with him. So happy memories. He yeah. He's still in my behind me in my bookshelf, and at least we know we can take him down and open him up and have him back. Thanks to yeah. the amazing amount of of equally amazing books that he wrote. Yes. Yeah. And I'm looking, well, I, looking I heard forward that he, he... Sorry. No, I, just, I was just thinking that I'm really looking forward to getting my hands on Brian and May's Peculiar London, which will be his last testament of to his love of London town, I think. Exactly. Yeah. And I think, um, I think Word Monkey's coming out shortly i saw a cover for word monkey which is his last um last in a series of memoirs so chris will live on certainly in his work so um from living on let's go to the undead um <laughs> the book of goth fabulous book i've so loved it i might not have the right book bag for your publisher but i do have a pretty fantastic bookmark which has yeah that's, That's pretty, pretty good, gorgeous, isn't, it? isn't it? Yeah. I oh, wrote it. Um, oh, I read geez. it with the appropriate bookmark, which is always good to do. So, um, Kathy, I wanted to take you back actually, um, because I saw that you yeah. uh, worked at sounds practically as a nipper. You cut your teeth at sound. You cut yeah. your fangs at Sounds Magazine, the, the legendary music mag. Yeah, no, I was extremely fortunate. And when I look back on it now, I can hardly even believe it happened because I was such a naive little hick from the sticks. I just came up from Norfolk when I was 18. I got a place at London College of Fashion and uh, they they did work placements. And when I, I'd been studying fashion in Yarmouth, where I come from, and I thought I might have a crack at it because I obviously really interested in clothes and looks and and all of that but when I got to London I realized it was really not a game for a hit from the sticks most of the classmates I had were uh, from a different strata of society to myself shall we say and um, I did a couple of fashion placements which they just let you make the tea and things like that mm. So then, but then, for really fortunately for me, there was an old girl of the London College of Fashion called Lynn Parker, who had a PR company. She came in and gave us a talk and said, I've got the account for Regden Festival. If anyone wants to come and work for me in the summer holidays, me, 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 <laughs> say that. I did that and I talked to all the journalists and photographers I could from the national the uh, three music press, national music press that there were, Sounds and Emmy and Melody Maker. And Sounds were uh, the friendliest. And this photographer, Steve Double, said to me, um, the place is run by students, so give the editor a tame steward, give him the ring, and I'm sure you'll get your placement. 
so I did and he was right Tony was you know he he did give me actually a bit of a more rigorous interview than the one that got me into London College of Fashion where where I just remember all I talked about was Jimi Hendrix and Oscar Wilde but my course tutor was very into both those people <laughs> and wants to live next to Jimi Hendrix so that, that little spell worked all right and Tony was a bit more rigorous but he, he just wanted to make sure I really loved music he would okay work on the news desk for two weeks and I learned more in those two weeks than I learned on the rest of my course. I was, had a lovely news editor, Hugh Fielder, who, who had seen the spectacles of Jimi, Jimi Hendrix for his, with his own eyes. He was, he, you know, he was around in the 60s and he's seen it all. And he taught me everything. And yeah, they let me do a review and then an interview. And then Tony went, yeah, you can do this. So I carried on writing for them while I was in my final year at London College of Fashion and then just carried on freelancing for them ever since. So I really was very lucky, but yeah. I well, paid attention great... to all the journalism classes. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, getting into gigs freeze is good, isn't it? It's great when you're a student. It was amazing. I mean, I don't think I was ever richer, actually. I don't think I'd ever been as well off when I was a student. And I had a student grant and I had free records, free gigs, and I didn't have to pay tax. Those were the days. Yeah. But yeah, it I was incredibly lucky. Any memorable interviewees? Um, well, I, I remember how excited I was at my first gig because it was May. I had two nights at Hammersmith Odeon and they had the bomber on stage, which was that was pretty amazing. My favourite interviewees, gosh, well, I, I'm i really lucky that I got to interview the Cramps a couple of times, and they were amazing. And that well, there's a lot of stuff I did in those days that I could draw upon for this mm. goth book. And the one that mm. really touched my heart the most is it's Lux and Ivy, because now they've been parted. And it, it's so sad, because they've been together since they were teenagers. And the interviews were hilarious. I mean... They finished each other's sentences. They said hilarious things nonstop. They were so cool and so brilliant. And we talked about space aliens, alien abduction, horror films, just everything. You know, Lux would have made a good uh, editor of 40 in time. And he, he just said brilliant things all the time. Like, what's wrong with the kids today? Why don't boys wear eyeliner anymore like Elvis used to do? And really important questions like that he would ask. <laughs> and Ivy was just, she was just so cool. <laughs> so, well, yeah. they're um, a big part of the book, um, which is hugely, yeah. I, mean, I mean, you must have thought, how can I ever cram everything into one book? But let's start with a basic question. What is goth? I mean, we're, are we going back to the gothic <laughs> novel a little bit? <laughs> yeah, little, well... Yeah, I what my general outline of it was. I wanted it first of all to be called Goth in the Season of the Witch was always the title, but the subtitle. I wanted it to be called Goth in the Time of Thatcher because I wanted to start it with her coming in and end it with her getting booted out, and have the music as the reaction to these turbulent times that we lived through in the eighties. So it sort of starts in the seventies, ends at nineteen ninety, and that was my cutoff point. But then. My publisher said, I don't want her name on the front cover because people might not buy it, which is a fair enough point. But I also thought I need to explain more than just, I think this was these bands and artists in this time were doing something that carried on a tradition that people, other artists um, and, you know, visual artists, musicians, writers, had, they were part of a tradition that went back. So I have in each chapter goth mother and a goth father who go back as far as Percy Shelley and the Bronte mm -hmm. sisters. And mm -hmm. and they, they sort of, I try and explain the whole history of the gothic through it. And actually, after doing quite a few talks now and book talks and tours, I've, um, it made me realise that it kind of, what the tradition that these people are in, and they, I do include also the German romantic tradition to a certain extent because there's some important 
German influences in them. I think they have a similar romantic tradition to us. Also, American Gothic, which we mentioned, the cramps, but that's a very important because it's Thatcher and Reagan were mangling the world. And the responses of people in France who've been through the trauma of World War II and things like that. So I think it's a tradition the romantics, the decadence, the surrealists, the Dadaists, they're all part of. And it, what really stood out for me was I suddenly realized halfway through this tour, like, William Blake sees the dark satanic mills go up at the start of the Industrial Revolution. And then the minor strike happens, the end of the minor strike halfway through the 80s. Mm -hmm. The best song I thought that was written about that was uh, 1984 by Neil Mottlami. Um, and he quotes Jerusalem, Justin Sullivan, the lyricist, quotes this green and pleasant land in 1984. And that's the end of the Industrial Revolution. So that's a whole cycle of different artists in different ways basically conveying the trauma that the British people have been through in those times and, and doing it in such a memorable way that everyone does remember William Blake and he gives his name to the Doors who were a massive influence with these bands in the 80s as well so yeah I think it's it's part of a tradition but it, it just in that short period of time with it there was some really amazing work done by these artists that will be as memorable, I think, as mm. Wilde and Baudelaire and, mm. and Blake and I like that. You, you draw in so many strands into the story. There's so many bands that I'd, I'd kind of forgotten about. I mean, it's yeah. a nice trip down memory lane in lots of ways. Um, but just thinking back to sounds, there's um, I remember that uh, Dave McCulloch, um, he was probably my favourite music critic at the time. I, I, I loved reading his stuff and I, I probably would have forgotten about that if I hadn't read this book. Um, it's, it's also a story of who's covering the music. There were some very important music writers. Yeah, there are some. And I wanted to give full credit. Yeah, mm. and also what they say at the time is so interesting, isn't it? Mm. Dave McCulloch was obviously a brilliant one and he wrote that very memorable um, obituary of, of Ian Curtis, which said, mm. this man lived for you, this man died for you. He saw the madness in your area, which I think Dave McCulloch got it right so many times. So did Bieber Cop. Um, so yeah. did Mary Howan, who mm. went on to become a filmmaker, didn't she? She yeah. said that brilliant quote about Joy Division, where she could see that in Gothic literature, it was castles and, and woods, but in in Joy Division, it was the city of Manchester as their gothic landscape. But, mm, and it's tower, so blocks cheap, as, I mean, tower blocks being gothic castles. Mm. Yeah, places of isolation and, and terror, you know, um, in this city that, and I was really interested to find a brilliant quote that uh, Bernard Sumner gave to uh, John Savage about how he had this real sense of loss about the city planners, when they, after the war, when they just kicked people out of terror houses and put them into tower blocks and his whole sense of community had been lost. The lovely nights they hold, everyone used to sit out on the street, the old grandmas in their chairs and the kids playing and summer nights that had all gone. And yeah, that's a really big part of the sort of, the trauma of the, you know, follow on from the war and how these people grew up in these strangely changing times to, and and how, you know, that also feeds into how they create this music that tells you everything really about what it was to live in that place at that time. You kind of begin yeah. the story with Joy Division, great place to start, but um, yeah. the possible first single is uh, Bauhaus, Bella Lugosi's Dead, Bella Lugosi. which is yeah. full on, full on <laughs> gothic. <laughs> it's, it's the things fantastic. went into it but it suddenly appeared and it was unforgettable yeah that's true I think that is the foundation single of God and it was brilliant I recently got to do a screening of The Hunger with Travis our mutual friend Travis Elber yes I couldn't Boston, come to that Rio. And how did it go but it, well it was brilliant Susie but mm. the thing that really stood out for me is the best bit is Bauhaus at the beginning and I think, mm. because 
David Berry, right, he's sort of, I know it's a bit sacrilegious to say anything bad about him now, but he had sort of started to get into his Tommy Steele phase right then and was, was, you know, yeah. the serious, you know, when he kind of went back to looking like he looked in the 50s and um, mm. although he is brilliant in the film and you can see all his Lindsay Kemp training when he suddenly becomes old, he does that really well. But I think it was because Bauhaus said this, that he, they, he was watching them do that performance in the Heaven nightclub in London. It's mm. pretending to be in New York. And I think it's because he was their hero. And it's almost, it's so brilliant because that film is about vampires and that's a really good analogy for the music business in itself, isn't it? Mm. He always feeding off the young and casting aside as soon as they've got a slight wrinkle. And David Bowie obviously can really relate to that in his career, how long it took him to get famous and how hard he tried to try. But I, it was almost like Peter Murphy got the power out of David Bowie and put in this mm. incredible performance, which, mm. which is so amazing. You know, it's captured mm. there in Amber. And then, but then Bauhaus split up quite shortly after that. So it's almost like that's at their apex. And they, they, they've reformed since and everything, but they're really a sort of unstable <laughs> quantity. They're always falling out with each other and, you mm. know. So I thought that was brilliant. And I just did think, God, he was so brilliant because he knew David Bowie was watching and it was like passing on a torch to him. It was just... Yeah, it was like an electrical yeah. circuit back and forth. It's it's quite yeah. <laughs> quite brilliant. I mean, I've seen that clip before, but not the whole film. So I, I would have wanted to see the whole film. But but yeah, that's the bit I really, really remember, I have to say. Yeah, that's the bit that really stands up. Interestingly, the rest of the film started to really remind me of Barry Lyndon. And then this is going oh. off at a tangent a bit. But then I also got to, to screen The Company of Wolves in in Newcastle Tyneside Cinema, and there was a bit in there that was very Barry Lyndon. So I wonder if that film just cast mm. such a big spell on, on the directors at the time, that, that wonderful yeah. Stanley Kubrick ever film. So, yeah, yeah anyway. <laughs> I, I saw I saw Company, Company of Wolves quite recently, actually, and again, it, it really stands up, you know, and, and it's mentioned it in the does. book. You know, it appears yeah, it's a it very... It's yeah, I of, think it sounds like better than The Hunger, actually. I think it's a more beautiful yeah. film and it makes more sense. I think it's brilliant that Neil Jordan let Angela Carter like, be involved in it the whole way through because that almost never happens. So, yes. That alone. Yes. Yeah, I love, the, um, I love The Huntsman. I mean, it's just so weird and so strange. I mean, you know, we're talking about a transgressive genre that does kind of mix old and young and life and death and and it, it isn't meant to be comfortable i mean the scenes with the young actress apparently she was the girl, the girl who plays rosaline she was too young to go to the premiere <laughs> you know and it's about it's about menstruation it's about your first period it's, it's <laughs> yeah. quite incredible and, oh god they that scene, do you remember the scene when Terence Stump glides through the woods in his black silver gaze? In a car. Rolls Royce, and he's yeah. staring at little kind. Do you know what? I'd forgotten, but that scene must have gone so deep into my subconscious because I had an almost identical one in one of my books, that old black magic I had of Rolls Royce, silver ghost, and spooky going on, evil going on in the woods at night. And it's like, God, that stayed mm -hmm. with me since I was six. 16 years old and came out in one of my books so this is what I mean by it's like an yeah. exchange of of ideas from people who are able to capture things in a certain really memorable way mm. yeah. I think um, another major figure in this book is Nick Cave uh, can you explain uh, the significance I mean he did that that non more gothic single release the bats <laughs> <laughs> which actually i don't know if this is true but i think that single was they they went on tour with bauhaus the birthday party this brilliant band that he came over from australia with um he were all fantastic brilliant <laughs> in a very mm. different way but brilliant guitarist Roland Howard, fantastic bass player mm. Tracy Pugh. He looked like a cross between Johnny Cash and Muscle Mary with his Stetson mm. and his big tash. Mick Harvey, he can play anything, and 
think Barry Adamson memorably described him as playing the drums as if he just wanted them to fall apart. And Phil Calvert, the original drummer, who also plays this really nice supportive role in helping the Cocteau twins get signed to 4AD. So yes, yes. hats off to all of them, they're all brilliant. Mm -hmm. But Nick, you know, he probably was after Ian Curtis died. And there's a really strange psychogeography moment about Ian Curtis, one of his last gigs at, that, at the Moonlight Club in West Hampstead, which is a really important portal because the Banshees and Adam and the Ants used to play there a lot yeah. when they were unsigned as well. And it's like two weeks after he died, the birthday party played a gig at that club that Daniel Miller and Ivo Watts Russell see, and that's what gets them there. So it's almost like Ian Curtis was sort of like the shamanic figure, I think. He went out mm -hmm. there and did things that normal people don't do, and Nick Cave was just, had the same sort of role, I think. He, also, he obviously really stands out because he is so tall, and his, like Lux interior, again, his hair is another six inches there, and they were, the birthday party were that's just probably the most amazing live band you could have ever seen in those days. They would have, anyway. So, what was your original question? Because I've gone so far off the track. No, I, I think I'm just going to throw I names at you. You just you just react to the names <laughs> I, I throw at you. I think that, um, yeah. like I oh, say, I'm memory loan. I've remembered now what it was. They went on tour with Bauhaus and they didn't like Bauhaus. And I actually think Release the Bats was their comedy response to Bella Lugosi's Dead with them sort of taking the piss. But because they sound so bloody awesome, you know, well, all us goss out there took it seriously <laughs> and it still sounds really amazing coming through mm. good speakers really loud. Mm. I went to the Back Cave party a few months ago and, and um, it was playing. It was brilliant. It was so good to hear it again like that. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah there was a yeah. time so, when... Yeah birthday party could clear a room quite quite easily <laughs> put on and, a birthday party uh, album when it's time for people to go or really if you really want to get rid of everybody Frankie Teardrop by Suicide who are one of my goth fathers and <laughs> I, I could never understand I've seen that fan get bottled off at least twice by an incomprehensible pending audiences but I still don't understand why because mm. to me it sounds so beautiful Alan Vega sounded like Elvis in space and mm. you know mm. an amazing science fiction landscape evoked by Marty Rev and you know mm. what kind of fool doesn't like that anyway <laughs> Yeah, well, um, I saw, I was reviewing for the student paper and actually for a local paper in Leeds, and I, I reviewed the birthday party. And for one thing, the sort of, who are these people coming in here? They're from Australia. <laughs> um, but they, I, I, it was an amazing night. Um, and I remember uh, Nick Cave, between songs, would browse his Gideon's Bible which presumably he'd taken from a hotel drawer. He would just sort of stand there. Um, and, I, yeah. I, and I remember somebody shouted something, you know, like, get off or you're rubbish or whatever. And he looked up and all he said was, in his Australian accent, which I won't do, you fucking idiot. And that was it. There were no, no more heckles. It was, it was so fierce. <laughs> He looked so yeah. mean. It was like, right, we'll all, we'll all, we'll all, you know, stand up straight and listen to this. This guy really means business. <laughs> Get down and pray, sinners. Pray to me. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so, Cindy, you were in Goth Central at the time, and you were in the I know. center of Goth Zone. I know. Did I was unappreciative. Well, I I actually got. <gasps> a, I knew somebody who was a friend of the sisters. <laughs> this is bad, and they said they they brought me a demo tape, partly because I was reviewing music, and I lasted. I'm. Mean, this is terrible. I lasted about thirty seconds, and I and I just went, oh, you know, rubbish. You know, it's just. <laughs> I just didn't. I didn't Shut really get it. I know it is, um, but I did see I did see the cult or 
death cult or whatever they were called at the time. And of course they came from Bradford. Oh. So in Leeds, it's like, oh yeah. God, who are these people from Bradford? We hate you. <laughs> but you know, they were amazing. Yeah. And, and, and Asprey is such an incredible performer. But um, yeah, that was another really memorable, memorable gig. There, there was a lot going on in Leeds. I mean, a friend of mine knew Mark Almond. He was sort of living around at the just round the corner in a perfectly ordinary flat. So yeah, a lot, a lot of the, Amazing. a lot of the people in in the in the book. Um, yeah, it, it brought back good yeah. times. But yes, I'm I'm very sorry yeah. I didn't spot the the sisters. <laughs> My bad. I would have loved. I never actually got to see them with Ben Gunn, which I'm really sad about. I did see them with Gary Marks, which I'm pleased about. But yeah, I was just a little bit too young. Mm. But because mm. I think my favourite sisters are the sisters captured on that on that compilation, the Some Girls Wander by Mistake, which I love the title of very mm. much. The early singles that they made in a shed in Bridlington are my favourite ones. <laughs> Well, um, you've done so much research on this. I, I, I mean, I almost needed kind of family trees. Somebody did rock trees, didn't they? Rock family we trees did, at one yeah. point. We started Zigzag but magazine, yeah. You've yeah. really traced, like, this person went on to do that. And, you know, there are a lot of casualties in this story, and there are people who sort of abruptly disappear. Um, but there are these strains yeah. of Gothic, aren't, aren't they, that... Um, constantly mute out yeah. and you know people then go on to become producers i mean you you mentioned cocteau twins that i wouldn't have thought um were a gothic band per se but um i mean the other thing to say is you describe music so beautifully and that's obviously your your background in music journalism you know coming yeah, up with uh, yeah. beautiful phrases to evoke music is is quite difficult yeah, I suppose that is quite a good training ground for becoming a novelist, actually. Um, but I'm glad I've done all of the things that have, because I do honestly think it's... This book, it was like, to me, a series of concentric circles, because everyone does overlap at some point. Mm. It, it, it's mm. a very small handful of people making all this stuff happen, and um, and they get in and out of bands with each other and in and out of bed with each other as well, obviously. But they do get in and out of bands with each other and inspire each other. And so I kind of almost had to do it slowly moving through the 80s in a circle with certain bands that I think signify something, you know, like it starts with Susie and Joy Division and The Cure and Magazine because they came straight out of punk and being fans of the Pistols, although they, none of them sounded like the Pistols, which is so interesting. And then, yeah, so and then you slowly go, but then I have to explain all the Americans coming over, the gun club, and mm. I put the birthday party in with the Americans with Lydia and um, the gun club because they all worked together, and I think they all really inspired each other. And, you know, and then you've mm. got people like Kid Congo, and he's going to be in loads of, he's going to be in the gun club, and the Cramps, and back to the gun club and the birthday party. Um, mm. And then you've got Patricia Morrison, his bandmate, is going to be in the Sisters of Mercy and from the gun club to the Sisters of Mercy. And then she's going to end up being Mrs. Davaney. And then there are all these little mm. concentric circles that. So we slowly move through the decade. But I hate, I think I got in all the people that I thought made really significantly the best music and the, the mm. stuff that impact, rather than anyone who sort of copied them. And there's quite mm -hmm, a lot of that. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, by yeah. the end of the eighties when everything's overblown and quite mad. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean looking at the banshees, they they had a fair few uh personnel uh changes over the years. And it even when sort of some people go off and do their side projects that are under a different name and they're making EPs and they're doing slightly different sort of music. It's just, it's just so creative, but Susie is another yeah. absolutely iconic figure in this, isn't she? Have you, have you ever yeah. interviewed her or met her? Yeah, I've met her. I did a quite a long interview with her and Steve Severin for Melody Maker, which I was luckily it was about twice upon a time the singles album. So she talked a lot about a big period of time in that interview, and I was 
able to use quite a lot of that. And she also talked about how much she loved Julie Driscoll, and that's the name Season of the Witch comes from Julie. It's Donovan's song, but Julie's mm. version is so amazing. And she talked about how she saw her doing Wheels on Fire on top of the Pops and thought, yeah, I want to be her. <laughs> She's a bit different mm. from Lulu, isn't she? The amazing <laughs> Julie. And when you look at footage of Julie, the way she moves around, you can see that Susie got, you know, we really got quite a lot from her. She was her goth mother for sure. So, and also I did do a bit of work for the Bachelors in the early 90s. I worked for them. So, and I met my dear friend, Billy Chainsaw, through that. Um, and their their office was amazing, actually. Talk about psychogeography. On the corner of All Saints Road was his office with Aki from Southern Death Cults, his label um, in the basement. Then there was the Sisters of Mercy. <laughs> then there was the Banshee's office. And then there was <laughs> my friend Anton, who had all Sub Pop and all those people. So it was the Tower of Power of the goth world. And um, yeah. So I did used to hang out with Steve Severin and Billy quite a lot, and we used to go and see mad films together. And yeah, mm -hmm. Steve Severin's really, really articulate and interesting person, actually. So mm -hmm. yeah. And but we didn't, I didn't have a clue. Well, we chose that CD front cover that she would be back doing that tour. So that's just fate. <laughs> fate yeah. and fortune. Yeah. I interviewed. That's really who um, I was going to go on. Sorry. Sorry, I was just going to say, but who else is going to go on the cover? Really, she's the queen. So mm. you, you mm. sorry to interrupt. Mm. Yeah. And I interviewed uh, Robert Smith of The Cure a long time ago now, over 20 years ago. Um, and he's he still, you know, he was sort of hair and he didn't have the lipstick on. It was his, just his normal daytime look, I think. Um, and he said something incredibly funny to me. Um, I mean, the whole thing, he's, he's a lot more whimsical and funny i think than than people assume um yeah and i said do you get accosted by fans very often um what's that like and he gave he gave this very disgruntled look and he said well people burst into tears a lot <laughs> <laughs> and it's this wonderful image of you're just going around you know going to tesco's and somebody's crying <laughs> because they've They've seen you, I thought. <laughs> oh. oh. One interesting thing, though, him, Robert Smith and Nick Cave both loved Alex Harvey, and they're probably right, the yeah. two most successful people in this, you know, of all the people. Like, they continued to carry on being successful and um, not really, without ever really compromising what they do either, which is... Because they also had really good record companies behind. They had Daniel Miller and um, obviously Chris Parry behind Robert mm. Smith. So they had sympathetic people who weren't going to put them off the way some of the other bands were treated so badly. But um, Alex Harvey himself drops dead before his 47th birthday from, from the overwork of the music business, which, mm. you know, it, that's a cautionary tale when you said there's a lot of carnage at the end of the book. Yeah, there is, isn't it? The music world is a very gothic place, really, isn't it, when you think about it? Mm. Mm. It, it exists at night, uh, comes to life at night. People get drained and sucked of their blood and energy. <laughs> they're, a, yeah. they're a kind of they're puppet masters. And... Their... Yeah, yeah. Puppet, evil puppet masters. Always looking behind your back see what's coming up behind you, what's going to knock you off your perch. Yeah. Mm. So, and, of course, they're more sensitive. They're more sensitive. You know, sensitive people create brilliant art, but it's really mm. difficult for them to live in this world of commerce. So they turn to too much drinking and too much drugs, and that does for a lot of, a lot of the heroes of my book at a really, sadly, very young age. I think Jeffrey Lee Pierce is one of my favourites. What he manages eight years more than Hank Williams, and that's it. Mm. So sad. Mm. Yeah. And Raymond Howard didn't get to the 50, and nor did John McGeoch, the two greatest guitarists. So, you know. Yeah, yeah. well, it, you know, it's, it's a, a great book in terms of bringing them all together and bringing, bringing them 
new life in a way and um, paying homage to uh, people who have influenced so much yeah. and and often the influence the influencer gets forgotten uh it's only kind yeah. of music journalists with long memories <laughs> who know where this stuff is coming well, from that's why yeah, and because there was this fantastic resource on Rock's Back Pages run by Barney Hoskins, he was again one of the great journalists of that time. And, you know, I was able to dig out a lot of really good stuff um, and try and pay homage to really everyone that helped me on my journey and who said the best things about these bands. And, you know, some of the old interviews are far better than anything you could get out of people now. So I think it's better to use mm -hmm. those old quotes. You know. Because the sort of job, I think in this instance, it's a bit like the Lord of the Rings, this book, it's like darkness has fallen on our land and our strange, desperate band of heroes must try and save us. <laughs> and, and, and yeah, and so it was my job just to tell, I think, the story in, their, in the most compelling and dramatic way, being true to goth, the yes. spirit of goth that I could, and to also continually mock the word goth, which, you know, it was a perjurative for a long time. The first time I ever heard it was somebody, goth, what creature are you, a goth? Like, say, so sneering mm. from mm. a slightly old, it was in the mid-80s, and it was a slightly older person who had seen the Sex Pistols, who had seen the Damned play with T-Rex at West Front and really a very important Norfolk gig. And they're looking at somebody much younger who's just bought Grimly Fiendish, by the damned because it's in the chart. I'm like, what do you know of this? <laughs> you young fool. Uh, so, but I also wanted it to, it to be my mission by the end of the book that goth would be a word said proudly now rather than everyone going, oh, I'm not goth, I'm not goth, which everyone did. And if, you know, loads of people still do. So I want to make it glad to be goth, basically. Let's talk about uh, another band who I saw in Leeds and I, I think are fabulous or were fabulous, UK Decay. Um, and you oh, reminded well. me of their utterly terrifying, is it a werewolf song or something? It's not, you werewolf. can't really call it a oh, song. Yeah, it's so oh. No. no, it's like the Blair Witch Project, isn't it, before it happened? It's like a field in record form. Of, yes. Yeah. Oh. You know, they, maybe they after they left Leeds, they went up on the moors and found the slaughtered lamb and found, yeah. <laughs> recorded the werewolf changing. Yeah, it's and he Abbe from from UK to K. He was the first person that I found in when I was at Sounds. I was doing it at the end of the eighties. I was doing an almanac looking back through the decade and the bound issues for the best quotes. And he was the first person I found saying the word gothic. And he called mm. his records punk gothic. So, gothic. yeah, I think he's a quite yeah. a, he's a formative person in punk um, in goth. But UK mm. to K don't get remembered very much now. Mm. So there are a few bands in there that you know proper the old goths of my age will remember them, but mm. they kind of been forgotten along the way. So there was them and the mob. I wanted to put them in, even though they didn't exist for very long. Because I thought that that whole anarcho punk side of things that came out of Crass and was so important for Ian Asbury, you know, mm -hmm. that he was following the Poison Girls around when he got taken to the house where the rest of what would become Southern Death Cult were, which was a house where mm -hmm. Justin from Mob Army, Jules, and Stephen Wells lived. So that was an important. <laughs> 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 Can you imagine, you know, doing a washing up rotor for for that lot, or <laughs> what it would be like sharing? Stairs, <laughs> well, the thing was at the time Stephen Wells was pretending to be Susan Wells when he was writing for Enemy, and jo Jordan was the Jules Jordan. Jules was doing his voice when when they rang up. So really, that, if you ever, yeah, if you ever knew. Or Stephen Wells, who went long before his time, mm. he can't really, he's not really a convincing woman. <laughs> yeah. the, um... That's the other thing that I was going to say about 
the psycho geography now before you mentioned that Leeds and Bradford were always against each other and, and mm. have been so since mm. William the Conqueror's time when Leeds was spared the harrowing and mm. Bradford got it but that's the other thing goth and the minor strike brings them together for the first time mm. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, I'm. I'm just thinking about that. Um, the UK DK single, which is was a uh, twelve inch, and there's about five minutes of atmos atmosphere, you know, before the song starts. And I I couldn't listen to it at night on my own. It was just too scary because it, yeah. it sounds like something happening in the next room. It's really, it's really scary. And yeah, and the yeah. other thing is, I, I remember going to see them in some awful little dive in Leeds. I can't remember. It was the sort of place where the stage is only sort of a foot high, so the audience is right there. And the yeah. poor poor guy, Abbo, was he? Well, he got, yeah. he just, it was still the era where people just spat and spat. And it was a bit, you know, it was yeah. a bit late for that kind of caper, but yeah. there was just somebody who just yeah. kind of gobbed at him for about from about a three-foot distance. And he just sort of yeah. carried on singing and just said something like, you know, oh, oh isn't this fun or whatever. And, yeah, that it, it, I mean, good going was rough in those wished, days, wasn't it? But he wished he could have turned into a werewolf at that point and mm. ripped that bloke's head off who was gobbling on him. That would have taught yeah. him, wouldn't it? Yeah, there were some yeah. pretty horrible yeah. scenes back in back in those days. Um, let's uh, let's pick a few goth fathers and goth mothers because there's some great characters there. I think Nico is a goth mother, mm. isn't she? Yeah, she had to be in there, didn't she? Absolutely, and her life was so gothic as well, wasn't it? Yes, really disturbing, yeah. really disturbing upbringing during the war. Seeing the trains mm. to Auschwitz going past through the forest. Mm. And, you know, whatever happened to her father was. Deeply unpleasant, whichever account you, you mm. listen to. And then the really mysterious end of Nico's. Mm. She, mm. On, my, on the sunniest place on earth, going off to pipe and hashish and Ibiza and wraps a black scarf around her head and cycles off into the sunset. And that's the end of her. And mm. all those. My, I, I kept, couldn't stop listening to all tomorrow's parties actually just to hear her sing those words which could have really been written about her life actually mm. um i was quite sad because you're not i wasn't actually able to quote all those words in full so if you don't know them, look them up i would say because they really it's almost like lee reed wrote this song about her before he even met her mm. um mm. but yeah did you her, did I you read the recent did you read the recent biography Maybe about two years I've, I've ago, I think, or you. In the, yeah, it is really brilliant, isn't it? Mm. It's really good about her whole background, and yeah, yeah. The, Jennifer the Lou Reed very threatened, seemed to be very threatened by her, and as a, as um, I don't know anybody who took any focus off him. Yeah, he wasn't keen. Yeah, on. Well, yeah, that's one one of the reasons I wanted to try and give a big up to most of the women behind the famous blokes in my story, like, mm. you know, Emily to Lane. Yes. girlfriend who did say that. And Claire Shearsby, who basically, Andrew Eldridge's first girlfriend, who, who taught him how to be, well, you know, he was very intelligent, but I think she taught him how to be cool. Um, she mm. was the one that everyone in Leeds looks up to and of course her opposite number the other blonde bombshell of the Leeds DJ scene Annie Hogan who mm. did so much beautiful music for, for Mark Almond and, and you mm. know Jules who managed the Immortal Army and you know or he, as well as being so brilliant in her own right I mean she was a massive influence on me when I saw her get a whole room full of punk rockers to shut up and listen to her mm. I just thought yeah that's, you know, that's brilliant. Her and Lydia had loads of brilliant female role models, actually. Um, mm. Lydia probably being the most hilarious and fearless one of them all. And uh, if anyone ever says that goth 
isn't political and it isn't funny. They haven't met Lydia Lunch. Basically. And let's talk a little bit about uh, the club, the club of the um, the scene, the Bat Cave. Uh, I I have a theory about the Bat Cave. Um, thinking about what else was on at the time, you had these clubs in London, you know, where the people on the door would insult you, and you weren't you weren't dressed well enough and you didn't know anybody. So you could just, you know, you didn't get to go to the club. Um, that, that sort of horrible snobbishness in a way, I think that scene is more written about than things like the back cave. But my theory is that, that the back, somewhere like the back cave, because it was for outsiders and weirdos, it was actually more inclusive. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, that is the whole thing about goth, and that's what's been really nice doing my little tour, is meeting people saying it just brings back all these brilliant memories, and it was. It was a place where all the freaks, whatever kind of freaks you had in your town, it's slightly varied from time to time, and you know, and ours, it was bikers and older punk rockers who kept us little more sensitive ones safe. But, yeah, it was a place where all the boys and girls could share their lip liner and hairspray and without fear of being kicked to death by the marauding beer boys and you know luckily the fact that the outcast drank in our pub meant the beer boys would, wouldn't go near it um mm. so yeah and the back cave that's where all these people met when they first came to london that's where you know susie mm. susie and the branches kind of play a part in everybody's story i think they were really mm. you know certainly annie hagan said that susie and Budgie were so nice to her when she first moved to London and really Lydia lent her her flat and Lydia was a back cave regular and she was going out with Jim Thurwell by then who had got his flat this is one of my favorite bits of research he got his flat because he was friends with um oh god sorry uh I've lost my thread. Sorry, I'm trying to cram so many. He was friends with Keith Allen. He, the comedy oh. store was in the same address. And yeah, Keith yeah. Allen broke open their spot that they shared on Westbourne Graves. They, and he also said to Jim, you know, you've got to get out of your bedroom now. Stop making all these little tapes and be in a band. So he was sort of in so that, the comedy store at the same address. And, mm. you know, that the address being the former home of Nell Gwynn as well. And, and you know, oh. you could write a whole book about that building, but yeah, this is where yeah. everyone met and mingled, and all the mm. splinter groups. And, and it was the same in Leeds, weren't it? And all the places that you would have been to, like the Faino and the Faversham, and yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, spent many a happy evening at the Faversham. <laughs> I have a great story about the Faversham, actually, and and this isn't. Um, I wasn't here for this. This is a friend of mine who was in the Faversham and <laughs> he was playing, I, I think, pinball or something. And so this must be May 1980. This is before I ever got there. But um, the door flew open and somebody in the sort of, you know, the long overcoat came in absolutely distraught and said, Ian Curtis is dead. <laughs> and everybody's going, no, what, what, what's going up? What did he say? Can it be true? You know, mayhem ensues. Oh, and my friend apparently said, what? The lead singer of Secret Affair. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, um, he was another Ian, wasn't he? <laughs> oh, but the God, idea of... Right. The idea of all, you know, and they were, they would have, I would have classed them as goths, really, proto goths, um, of getting upset about the lead singer of a minor mod band is really rather. Oh, no. oh my God. I suppose he had to get his great crew after that one, didn't he? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, my friend probably got ejected from the from the Faversham at that point. Um, but yeah, what a great, <laughs> yeah. What a great yeah. story. I mean, I wasn't there. I can't I can't um verify I can't verify it, but it's a good enough story to stand on its own right, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where was your favorite 
place to hang out in Leeds and Susie? What was your favourite um, nightclub? Or I place? used to go a lot to the warehouse, so most of my gigging was done at the warehouse. And there was a place that was in the... It was in the basement of the Merrion Centre. That's where I saw the birthday party, but I can't. I, that might have been the fan club, actually. Um, yeah. But I used to go to the warehouse a lot, and um, I would go and review books. Um, sorry, review gigs for this local paper, and um, I'd always get in, and I was always on the guest list. And I always had a plus one, and there was a woman on the door, and every single week for sort of three years she pretended she didn't know who I was and then we'd always go through this you're not on the guest list you're not on the guest list and I go I am and sometimes I'd lean over her and go I'm on the guest list there plus one um, and then she'd go all right then go in and this happened for years and then the very last time I went we went through the ritual one last time I must I was about to leave Leeds and she still did this, you're not on the guest list, you're not coming in, and yes, I am. And I, it, it's it's strange, isn't it? I mean, the music business has this kind of, um, you've got to be persistent at all yeah. levels. Yeah. You've not got to be put off or no, told you can't. Really you, no, you've just got to do it. Really yeah. <laughs> yeah, that when you're young, you're so much more fearless as well, aren't you? Right? You know, it's, yeah. But that's also that that's like you're a southerner, isn't it? You're not coming in, I reckon, is behind some of that. Do you was think? that at the time when you Yeah, I think it's like you're not from around here, are you? Well, I you definitely know, wasn't you know, from around that's, there. <laughs> that's part of what I'm sure that's part of what that was, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean I'd yeah. always sort of ring anyway. up, you know, I would have rung up in advance and been, yeah, you're on the guest list, and then you go there, no, you're not on the guest list. And it was just mm. it was just like a strange yeah. ritual you had you seemed to have to go through. That <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I know, and also I had at one point at sounds there was somebody pretending to be me who was getting in to fix as well. Wow. So that can happen too. You know, especially That's quite good. Just, Starting off on, yeah. So I had a doppelganger then, yeah. And maybe I still have one there. Did you Did you ever meet your doppelganger? <laughs> no, she's always one step ahead of me. Yeah. Wow. But that's when you the thing about them. in Leeds, yeah. Hmm. When you were in Leeds, was that the time of the Ripper? Was he still abroad when you were there, or had they caught him? Just like caught. That? Just been caught. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, but, you know, the vibe hangs around for a very long time with somebody like somebody like the Ripper, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, they, yeah, it, I mean, it was a strange city. I, I loved it there. But it was also a city where people shouted at you from their cars and people would say, th yeah. you know, like if you were sort of a student or you were dressed in any kind of punky way, you know, people. You'd have people shouting. I mean, uh, you know, my my then boyfriend, somebody just ran up very fast, punched him and ran away again. You know, it was that sort of that sort Yeah, of that's class. the sort of thing we all had to put up with, isn't it? Yeah, from the yeah. That's why we needed our yeah. little goth clubs. Yeah. And there yeah. were so many of them in that West Yorkshire area that's the area that's going to get devastated by the miners' strike had probably yes. the most goth clubs. Everywhere. Yes. And there's a, I don't know if you've seen that, I've got to put a link in the book, but there's amazing footage. If you put in Batley nightclub goths, there's a whole evening of the but Batley equivalent of the Bat Cave. Cool. And it's just like getting your childhood back watching that video. Oh, great. So it, yeah. It's Did very you, similar uh, list of. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, uh, a few years ago, I think this was at the British Library and they had a big goth, gothic exhibition. I wondered whether you went to that because I think there were there were a whole load of pictures by possibly Martin Parr, I want to say, up in Whitby. And do they still the do a kind fest. of vampire weekend, a goth fest? Yeah, they do do it all the time. Um, mm. Yeah, twice a year I think there's a goth fest up there. Um 
yeah, and the couple that I've, I've just spent a fantastic weekend in Newcastle with got married at Whitby Abbey. So they had the ultimate Gothic wedding, which is, <laughs> and I love Whitby. And you, when you go there and you stand up on that cliff top by the ruins of the Abbey, you just think, yeah, Bram Stoker, it just all came out of the atmosphere and through his. And he did find book there with Dracula's name, didn't he, in the library? That he got the name of, of Vlad Dracula of some oh, book. Yeah. And so it did. But yeah, you can just see it's the same as Arthur Conan Doyle stayed in, in Kramer in Norfolk when where the hellhound old Chuck who menaced me, my imagination anyway, through my, my childhood, I was always mm -hmm. scared of. Because if you looked into his eyes, you would die within three days, you see. So. <laughs> he was supposed to roam along the cliff tops and that Kramer was really popular in Victorian times with artists and writers, they called it Poppy Land and it is very, but he heard the story of old Chuck there that became the Hound of the Baskerville. So it's so another thing I like, these great authors being in these spooky seaside places and fantastic stories coming to them across the yes. waves, as Andrew Eldritch would say. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, um, and there's another, the, the painter, um, John Atkinson Grimshaw. Yes. He's always on the cover of, you know, Charles Dickens novels and things like that. But I think I think his stamping ground was Scarborough, which he, yeah, he, he, he lived he there, right there. Not, he was, yeah, he was actually from Leeds, yeah. And, and there are great pictures that he did of the head row with, I suppose gas lamps and moonlight, and I love all of that. I mean, that sort of that has a gothic yeah. feel to it, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah, he is, and I had to put him in the book because I and he did beautiful pictures of Hull docks at night, and you know, I've got Liverpool, a of family in Hull, and yeah, all those great places of those great cities of the north. He captured them in at their best. <laughs> mm. <laughs> For us goths, anyway, as night falling and that. That magical time when, when it's not just a tiny bit of twilight left in the air. Mm. That's when he mm. sweeps in. And also the great greatest name ever for a goth painter, Atkinson Grimshaw. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, there's also um, the lovely detail that Aubrey, Aubrey Beardsley, who's a goth father, uh, was called Daubrey mm. Weardsley <laughs> by Punch. I know. Isn't that fantastic? <laughs> that, that's quite a Isn't good touch fantastic? of humour for Punch. <laughs> Not known for its, yeah. its wit. I think it's Punch, isn't it? He, um, but he was somebody else. He was sort yeah. of, you, you say that he had this sense he wasn't going to be around very long. He had to, yeah. Yeah. he had to do his work fast, you know. Yeah, mm. yeah in, in common with people like Jim Morrison, you get the sense that, and Jimi Hendrix, they know their span on a, this life is mm. short and they cram it all full of mm. the most extraordinary work. I mean, yeah, Beardsley, mm. no one can draw like him before or since. He's quite amazing. And the fact that he, you know, what was he, 23 when he died yeah. and he'd done all that. And we, yeah, yeah he's still... And I really sort of love that little spat with him and Oscar Wilde when, and when it's again what you said before. Suddenly, Aubrey's getting a bit too popular, and Oscar's like threatened, so he's like trying to dismiss him. And Aubrey draws that hilarious picture of Oscar with his French dictionary madly cribbing away. <laughs> it's funnier than even anything Oscar can mm. say. So, hats mm. off to Aubrey Weirdly and yeah. his beautiful. And there's such equally doomed, beautiful sister. He, in yeah, Russia, I didn't know much. Know. I didn't know much about the sister. I knew that she had really encouraged him, um, but I didn't really know. I didn't really know her story. So again, another of the female muses and yeah. supporters and, and enablers. Yeah, because I thought and their that, story was a bit bit similar to Bronte's in that you know they're really close children brought up in a kind of stifling atmosphere and making their own imaginary world. Mm. Yeah. Mm. If um if Bela Lugosi's dad was the the first true goth 
single do we do we have a, a last one is there a last genius point that after which there isn't really anything as as resonant or does it just fade away gradually or morph into something else yeah that's quite, yeah that's quite a hard one to answer i guess um i think vision thing's probably the last amazing thing that andrew eldritch does um his response to george bush as well um, and Nick Cave carries on being pretty good, I think. I'm trying to think what the last record Let Love In was. Is that the last record he makes before Margaret Thatcher gets booted out? Yeah, he's still mm. got an amazing band there. He's gone through quite a few lineup changes and c carries on working with really talented people. So he's still mm. on top of his game. The, the cramps are still, the cramps are just going to carry on doing that until they die, as, as what happens. Um, but I do think that after that, it becomes, you know, I think the sitters and the cult had sort of blown out and gone a bit too, you know, too far um, anyway. And it just, it's a funny thing, I think, after 1985, hey, Equin, the and still made well maybe not up to the end of the 90s but after that that big schism of 1985 music stops being quite so political and becomes more escapist even the goth mm. people because the trauma has been so big i think that we can only look back to the past and they get ideas from psychedelia and from from heavy metal and you know that's all brilliant but it is by the end of the decade i would say it's one out of steam apart from these people like Mark Almond and Nick Cave who will carry on because they will go and find other things that interest them and mm -hmm. they won't stay doing one thing for too long. They'll find, like, he, Mark Almond will hear Jack Bolland go, right, I'll go down that avenue and, mm -hmm. you know, they'll keep themselves entertained because they're ceaselessly questing to make, to make great music and think what they can do next and they're also always working with in people who can inspire them but i think yeah after that it does mm. become like this new sort of goth groups like the mission and fields of the nephilim take over but they're they're just the sort of i don't know they're the, not doing anything the new yeah mm. and they're not yeah they're not sort of challenging anything like these i think the original artists were mm. it's more like rock and roll for a career move yeah, not a sort of divine, yeah. Um, mm. You know, even though you can enjoy seeing them, it's not really the same. Yeah, I I, I interviewed yeah, Nick not Cave a lot. Sorry, I interviewed Nick Cave a long time ago. Um, unfortunately, only on the phone. I didn't I didn't meet him. But again, this book reminded me because he wrote a novel called "And the Ass Saw the Angel." which sort of goes back to yeah. him reading the Gideon Bible. It was very biblical. But it was quite a yeah. funny interview because by this time I'd gone into the book world more than the music world. Um, and I felt that he, he yeah. didn't really understand that transition that a book is different from, from a record because um, everything that I said that was my take on the book, he'd say, well, I didn't mean it like that. <laughs> So he was kind of telling me yeah. off for reading it wrong. <laughs> Maybe yeah, he was back well, in you, you fucking idiot mode. <laughs> I, well, I think that it's interesting you say that because when I also went over to the book side um, through noir fiction and through Derek Raymond, who I met through Gallon Drunk, who James Johnson from Gallon Drunk ends up playing with Nick Cave at some point as well. So it's all mm. everything intermingles, but. I did find it's much easier to talk to authors than it is to musicians. They're not as defensive at all. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. a generalisation because some musicians are hilarious and brilliant raconteurs mm. as well. But mm. on the whole, I would say musicians who I probably struggle to say musicians and not magicians because I think they are magicians, but they mm. are more. And it, they want to put you to the test more and like see mm. how well you've paid attention to what they've been saying and if you get all the hidden things they've buried in there all the really intelligent ones are like that anyway so yeah yeah, 
But yes. I think that's interesting. That it's because that the lineage of that I think is Night of the Hunter, and I think that was a a true crime book that became a brilliant film with Robert Mitchum and Charles Law and first and last director. As you will know, but I think that was a massive influence on Goth that film. So yeah, and that yes. owner that Robert Mitchum had in that film, Preacher Pal. Because, yeah, That's... Jeffrey Lee Pierce used to come on stage pretending to be him, and then he said Nick Cave and his Gideon's Bible. Mm. Well, I mean... Love in one hand, you know, hate in the other. And it's like a massive bitch blade in their pocket. Going back to Bella Lugosi's Dead, straight from a film. You know, the, the imagery, everything is straight from a film that is from a book that is... You know, yeah. back to Villa Diodati, Horace Walpole, Beckford. Uh, yeah. It's an incredibly rich tradition that you've um, covered covered brilliantly. But as I say, and as you've mentioned, it's the trip down memory lane and the, oh, my God, I remember that gig. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> so, and just um, how brilliant that music was, yeah. Mm. Mm. And how, yeah. how kind of soulful and soul-stirring and... And I think it holds up. It's not just for angsty teenagers, you know. It, it holds up because of just just the sort of richness of the tradition, really. Yeah, and, and where it can take you to and all the stuff, like, you can learn from it, as I hope I demonstrate with my with my little grimoire there. Yeah, well, you're, you're rather large grimoire, I have to say. It's an amazing, it's amazing <laughs> work. Um, okay. Um, before dawn comes, I will I will leave you our imaginary dawn. <laughs> I will leave you with my three Before questions. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh God, sunlight! Like, oh, that I think no, that's sunlight no. on my face. Oh, yeah. I better better go quick before I disintegrate. Um, three questions that I'm asking everybody, <laughs> Kathy. Um, so do you have a favourite artwork, and is it Fusely's The Nightmare? <laughs> Uh, I was tempted by that, actually, but what I went for in the end, and I was also really tempted by John Atkinson Grimshaw, because I just said, oh. but we've talked about him, so yeah. just as well, what I went for in the end is an experiment on a bird in an air pump by Joseph Wright of Derby. Right of Derby, um, yes. Which is, it's amazing. I absolutely love it. Um, and. Uh, yeah, I go and stare at that quite often because it's free to go and stare at in the Tate Gallery through time mm. thing that they do um, that you can just access. And it's just the light in that. It is a really gothic picture, isn't it? It's like, mm. it's really quite, the poor little bird in the middle is going to die because they're taking all the air out of his pump. But it's the faces of the people around it and the light coming, the way he captures the light. And it's that moment when... It's sort of it's a gothic moment, isn't it, when science mm. tries to take on the supernatural and tries to find an, a way of banishing the, you know, the supernatural mm. back away. So it's a pivotal moment, and he captures it beautifully. And the, the one guy doing the experiment kind of looks like Dave Vanian as well, which makes it really good. <laughs> That's really always cool. a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, there's so, yeah. there's a few in painting. If you if you go to Derby, there's a whole um, there's a gallery in the art museum there, and there's one that it, it, it seems to be about breaking up a tomb. So it's sort of skeletons, and um, I think it might be a philosopher <sighs> contemplating death. So there are skulls and bones, and anyway, you'll have to do that. Can go to Derby. Stamp again with his little. Yes, I will. I love Derbyshire and the Peak District. It's a very good mm. place to hang out. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah. So the next question, is there a book that you should have read by now and you haven't read and it's kind of haunting you slightly? What would that be? Yeah, it's Ulysses by James Joyce, which I bought when I was 16, determined to improve my brain and st still never got, I've still got the copy of the book I bought in this fantastic secondhand bookshop in Yarmouth that was right next to the Gothic pub, which was mm. great. Um, but yeah, I still haven't got my whole way through it, and I don't know. 
I try again every about 10 years and I think, have I reached the point of my brain, it can permeate? Have I got mad enough to understand this? But And Kate Bush helped, obviously, with her beautiful interpretation of the sensual world. Oh, yes, it, yes. Directed yeah. by video Neil Jordan and uh, the storyline there. But no, yeah, and it's quite similar to the feeling of the Company of Wolves because she's going through this forest at night and it's oh, beautiful. Yes, yes. She's got a really fab outfit on that I love to have. Yeah. Goth riding outfit. Yeah, like side saddle riding outfit. Really nice. Yeah. <laughs> it's made me think a little bit of Bat for Lashes. Bat for Lashes is is, is in the tradition. You know, it's yeah. very it's very witchy and moonlighty and um yeah, yeah. well very Ulysses cute, yeah. you can I, I think you can get a crib um which sort of tells you what to look out for each, you know, a bit like going on on literary safari in a way. Here's what you should be thinking about in this <laughs> section. Yeah, you, you know, you I might be able to glimpse. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so yes, that might you. it might help. <laughs> that, have you read it? Have you ever read yeah, it? Yeah, I have. I've read it a couple of times actually. Yeah. Um it was on my uh my course at Leeds, so we had to read it. Um and I think I've read it three times in all. I think I read it twice when I was uh I mean you have to gallop at it. Another thing I've heard. Another thing I've heard, I don't know if there is an audio book, but apparently it's brilliant if it's just read in an Irish accent or you imagine it being read in a just fantastic Irish accent. So that might be the yeah, way. It's sort it. of, it's garrulous and wordy. And yeah, I've heard that as a good yeah. tip anyway. But uh, yeah, see how you go. Be, I think yeah. you can dip in and out as well, you know. Anyway. Yeah. I will, uh, I think one day, when I become proficient enough mentally when I work hard enough I think I think one bit and it might be the oxen of the sun it's so difficult it doesn't matter how many times you read it you know I mean I'm sure there's an ing pref English prof somewhere going no it's all right but there's one that's just like oh I just I can't understand this bit and you gallop through it you know that's the only I, yeah the only I like the idea of Listening to Stephen Ray reading it or something that probably would work, wouldn't it? That would be the dream, wouldn't it? Yeah. Listening it to Stephen I, Ray re read the Dublin also, phone book. <laughs> he's also in the Company of Wolves as a yes. werewolf. <laughs> yeah. Big, yeah. big werewolf heartthrob. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh, brilliant! Yeah, somebody should sign him up immediately to do <laughs> to do the audible version of Ulysses. Um, and the last question: Have you had what's the silliest, funniest, most bizarre, weirdest response you've ever had to your work? What's the weirdest feedback or funniest feedback? Well, the one I enjoyed the most is actually keeping it Irish. Was my friend Anne was very good friends with Shane McGowan and. When my first novel came out, The Not Knowing, she gave him a coffee and said, it's all about Camden. It's all about this pub that he, the good mixer, I know, was really mm. brilliant. And part of the reason I wrote it was I wanted to capture that pub and Jerry's Club where I used to work in Soho. I wanted to, cap to capture how they were in the early Jerry's. In the early 90s when I first discovered it, and Derek Raymond took me down Jerry's the first time. So it was like a homage to, to all the people mm. that had taken me through into these behind the green door worlds, these secret <sighs> worlds. And uh, so she gave it to Shane and he did start reading it and uh, he <laughs> left it somewhere on tour. And, but he came back to and said, say, did you finish reading it? And he said, no, but I got the gist of it. <laughs> that that's good enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> that is pretty good. I mean, that's that's one well-read guy, actually. He's uh, yeah, exactly. So coming from mm. him, yeah, he's a genius. So that's crazy enough for me. <laughs> that's Thank fantastic. You very much to Anne for that one. Yeah. That should be on. That should be on the book jacket. That should be a quote. <laughs> that 
that's so good. I think I kind of I did put it on my website actually as for my crates for that book. I got we just you have to. Yeah. You have to. Okay, uh, the witching hour has come and gone. Dawn, dawn is about to break, um, or rather it's sort of lunchtime in July. <laughs> it's been wonderful talking to you, Cathy, about fabulous book. I shall wave it again, Season of the Witch, Yay! Susie on the cover. Yay! It's it's the goth <laughs> Bible, um, and, uh, yeah, you've, you've, done, you've done us black-hearted goths proud you really have so thank, thank you for joining you, me you. in the book bag thank you. brilliant <laughs> and thanks for watching um yeah that was a very non more black episode um join me again next time and i'll be interviewing somebody else as fascinating i hope it's a high standard as the brilliant Kathy Unsworth. Join me next time. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. <laughs>